the honor to be sitting next to a wonderful world-renowned artist. We are here at the Rubin Museum with Pavlos Samios, uh, who is exquisite. His work speaks for itself. We are here to discuss the Parthenon Enigma, because it is an enigma, and he's going to, to, to explain to us uh, exactly what the ancient Greeks and uh, the philosophy behind Phidias work. He has recreated uh, the friezes in color, and we're very excited to see your work. Uh, Pavlos, welcome to New York. What a joy and what a treat for everyone. Thank you very much. I'm very happy speak about the, the freeze of the Parthenon. It's a study I made for many years about how Phidias designed, how he was inspired from Delphi, and how in the end he will make the color. And I find out the colors and all the technique. Pavlos, what inspired you to study the Parthenon freezes? Everything starts when I was a student in the School of Fine Arts, which I decided to go to Delphi to study the Sifnian uh, uh, treasure, which has a relief. And I was curious to know how those people, a hundred years before I proposed, uh, they, they designed it and they sculpted it. So I took a special, uh, a special uh, license. license from the museum, and I went to, I, I can touch the relief. So I count it, I have some things to count it. And by counting, I find out that behind all that sculptures, all that reliefs that goes all around the temple, uh, was made by measures. Nothing was by luck, everything was measured behind. So as a student, it was a great idea for me to find out what happened. And when I find out that, uh, that of course helps me a lot to the School of Fine Arts when I make my studies, to understand how, when with help, help from my professors, to understand how I make the compositions. And then I find out the Byzantine art was doing the same thing, the uh, Renaissance was doing the same. Even now, the modern people, they have all that climax behind, all that, uh, you know, Pythagorean theory, how to put things in somewhere and how they are living. It seems that Phidias surpassed the, uh, uh, the, the cultures that preceded ancient Greece, uh, Egypt and, and Persia in, in sculpting. Tell us about his technique uh, and of, of his work and, he used, uh, and how he used the Pythagorean theorem. The Pythagorean theory, which I found out in the treasure of Siphonin in Delphi, was then the space you uh, you have a space, okay, you say it's one meter by three. And you want to do something on there, to put some figures. You cut this space in, with lines in the middle, then the middle of the middle, then the middle of the middle, and this way and the other way. So you have the drawing, you know what we are going to do. It's not, it's not there you are going to do, you have already your maquette, but the maquette is just the idea. When you start drawing your figures or the horses, all the lines of the animals or the people, they touch the lines. So if you have the back uh, of the horse or the, the end of the horse touching the lines, you have a side who goes everywhere the same, not bigger or smaller, which gives a rhythm. In the same time, if you have lines like that, like the back of the horses or the end of the head of the horses or the people, they are all in the same line. So this structure, structure which you don't see, it's under, gives you a power to your painting. The Byzantine people, they do as well in the frescoes. The Renaissance, they knew that. And they try to find the gold, the uh, mean. mean and all that. It comes from there comes from the idea of uh, Pythagoras, which was saying, if you want to put something perfect, uh, it's not in the middle. You have to find the gold line. The golden mean. Yes. You happen to be from Samos. Yes. Have they found anything related to Pythagoras there? 
I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Pythagoras was not doesn't stay in one place. He was, he yeah, was traveling. He aggressive. went even to India. He was, he, wants, he was a very curious man who wants to know everything. So he went. Unfortunately, a lot of information is lost. It, it may have existed. Of course, it existed in the past and things were recorded, but it has been lost. Tell us the philosophy behind all the freezes and the reasoning of, of, of the request to have these stories always embedded in the stones for the citizens. It's like, um, uh, of course, all that, they are, it, it's like reading the story. It's like a comic. It's like a story. There are the gods up there. There are the, the warriors with the horses. They have all the animals for uh, make the Theseus, how you call that, for the gods. And uh, all that, he has to put it on. So it was 156 meters of painting and sculpture. So he has to find out how he's going to do. Well, I'm not talking about what is Eleusinia Mysteria, the mystery of Eleusis. I don't know anything about, we don't know many things about that. And you said sacrifices before, a lot of things have not been interpreted correctly either. Many professors have, of course, tried, even Dr. Connolly with the Parthenon Enigma, her book was trying to uh, figure out what the freezes were saying, yes. what type of sacrifices were going on. I didn't do that. I mean, I'm working only as, let's say I was Phidias, I have that order to do the work and I have to find out how I'm going to put it on. Tell us a little bit about this, other than the Pythagorean. What else? Let's talk about the colors. Uh, before the colors, I have to tell you how he designed it. First, he made the Pythagorean drawings, I mean, cannabis, we call it, which is cut the space in the half of the half of the half of the half. And all the drawing, all, all the horses and the gurus and the people and the animals, he cut them in leather. He took leather, thick leather, we make the shoes, and he cut the figures around. So he has the drawings, I mean the animals, the feet was cut, the head was cut. So when he put the body, he puts the feet where he wants and makes the movement. So every time, make just a line behind, and then the other, and then the other, and then the other. And then he puts the people on top, which having the horses, and one is like that. One is like that, but he has the drawing. Did he do this for three-dimensional purposes to appear no, three-dimensional? No, two-dimensional. Two two-dimensional. Two two-dimensional in the in the reliefs. And when he finished all the clothes and all the realistic materials, he did it after models. I mean, he put somebody who puts the the, the cloth on him, make makes a drawing uh, exactly with details. So when he sculpted, he knows exactly the volume of the tissue, how it goes down, how it goes up, and this realistic thing with the drawing he has, because they know how to make a person, they know how to make the face, they don't have to see, that they know. The only thing they didn't know is how the cloth goes on, you know, in the women. How or, it fell. Yeah, how it fell, that's the word. Anyway, anyway, when they finish that, they sculpt it a little bit, they go six centimeters deep in the background, and then they have the reliefs already. And then, because they have the drawing, they start from the beginning, from outside, and they make the different levels. First, second, third, fourth, sixth, until the end. So it's one feet front, the other feet of the horse behind, and uh, the feet of the, of the man outside. So it's different, it's very little. It's just one centimeter. It's slight, very but slight. But this gives you the idea, because they work like it's too much, but it's not too much. It, uh, uh, they make the uh, perspective uh, the way they want to show that it's deeper, you know. And that helps the color, of course. The color I use for that uh, study I make, I find out many statues, especially in, uh, in uh, Volos Museum, which they find stones from the 3rd century, which they are already painted, and I find from there many colors. I find out the colors they use from stones, from ox from oxide, from metals, you know. And uh, I found uh, out uh, the paintings from Pompeii. Because the paintings, for the fresco paintings from Pompeii was the third century to the second century, but they are copying the reliefs of those great periods of classical Greece. So we know exactly, if you see well the, 
the, the paintings in, in, in the Pompeii, you find out they don't make a person because he was standing, they are copying a relief. That's why the shadows and the lights gives you the idea it was a relief. There is no background, there is no volume, there is no space. They make the space, but everything is flat because it was a relief. So I took from there the colors. And where do you, uh, can you just enlighten us a little bit on where the ancients found these colors through nature? Uh, when they make holes to find the silver and the gold, because they make big holes in the mountains, in the holes they find some lines between two different uh, sp uh, stone uh, was 10 centimeter or 20 centimeter. If on top was, uh, for example, uh, bronze, this, the green thing they find is the scuria, the rusted, the rust from the, the metal. metal. So they have oxidized many metals. They have the ochres that have all the red inside. Most of them they come from the whole. The name. Let's discuss Phidias. Great artist. He had helpers. Uh, how long did it take him to finish the friezes? Their work all together, the, the Acropolis was about 10 years. I think the freeze must be done in one and a half or two years. Mm -hmm. Because uh, after the design, he has a lot of a helper to, to put down, you know, all that different levels of sculpting. But after him and a few of the very good sculptors, they finished it. They make all those details, the eyes, the eye, horses, all the... Because don't forget, the the frieze of the Parthenon is in 13 meters inside of the columns. So the people they cannot see very well. Sometimes they say they make it for gods. Is there a reason? Yes. Yes, okay, <laughs> but uh, it's not, okay, we, we leave it like that. That is debatable. But the important is all the horses and the people, the, most of the details are under. That's why you see the muscles and the, and the, 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 the the, 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 veins, the veins, the veins of the, the muscles, horses. They're, pr 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 they're prominent. You see them from down yes. very well, very well, because it's the first thing you see when you are down. Has there ever been an artist after Phidias who can at least reach that level of, 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 of Of course. We have a lot of artists in this period. The classical period of 5th century was many. Artists, and you know, the most important thing which we don't make a lot of attention is uh, the, the miracle is the light we have in Attiki, in Attica, in Corinth, and all around, I mean, in, in all around that area. Because the light we have there, they've, when you make a sculpture and you put it in the sun, if the sun is very strong, it kills all the gray colors. So you have white and dark. In Attica is the only place in Greece which you have all the quality of the tonality from the black to the light. So this tonality gives you the impression of the classicism. Because if you don't have that, you don't need. Because if you make all the details and you put it in the sun, they go away, the forms. But in Attica, in Athens especially, they are there. So they, those people, they see the light and they work with the light. I'm sure that uh, you've been asked this question before, and, and, and it's important that, that you relay this message, I believe, as many times as you can. How important is it to unite the friezes? And why is it so important that the story must be together? Well, I'm telling you, uh, those are stalled, let's say. Uh, they went to, to England uh, from Elginia, from Elginia. But uh, don't forget that those things, all those years in London, they make their work. I mean, many millions of people they saw all that time. And don't forget that Europe and America was inspired from those sculptures. They inspired uh, not only for the sculptures, but for the temple as well. If you see all the big, uh, uh, I mean, the museums and all the big buildings around the world, uh, it's inspired from Acropolis. So let's say they worked for many years to do that. I mean, the culture from those sculptures 
they went around and they make the job. Now it's the moment to go back because it was always an excuse that we don't have a museum and a great excuse where you're going to put the excuses. If you put them back to Acropolis, I will give you, but the museum we don't want to give you, blah, 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 blah. I think uh, maybe they have to, to make a kind of uh, symbolio, a kind of uh, uh, an idea to give some of them for 10 years and then they come back and then they go because those belongs to Acropolis, of course but belongs to everybody at the same time because behold, be, behind that is the culture of the whole world. Not only Europe, it's the world which, with the philosophy, with the poetry, with the theatre and with music. It's, it's the, the top of that page. Many other cultures have tried to, to, to reach the heights and levels of the ancient Greek sculptors. Why is it that the ancient Greek sculptors stand out from all and you can always see and distinguish if it was made by a Greek. But do you remember what we say in the beginning? The Pythagoras drawing? Yes. Because the Greeks, they have always that level behind. The ancient, I mean the ancient before the Acropolis, before Phidias, very, even the very classical, which is very, very near to the, to the human being, they have all the muscles and everything. The way they are standing, the way they are moving, the way they are finishing, they don't do exactly the person who was posing for that. They are taking things from him, but they make the perfect nose, the perfect finger, the perfect body. The, you see? So the realism of somebody which is very nice and very good, which the Romans, they do that, they make the models, they make beautiful sculptures, but it's human. The sculptures ancient Greek from the big sculptor like uh, Olympia, like um, Praxiteles and all those. They have all that. Even you see the cloth wet in their body, you feel it was watering and you feel the way they do. But behind all that there is a geometry, a geometry which put the things and that was Phidias. Ethan Phidias who used all the all that secret which they, we don't know actually now. We try, that's why we try to do all that, to find out of Pythagoras. We cannot thank you enough for bringing your work to New York. We cannot thank the Rubin Museum enough and all the wonderful, uh, the Hellenic American Foundation, uh, the Cultural Society and their wonderful work to bring Greece's light and uh, talent to the rest of the world again and to remind people of the greatness of the ancient Greeks. Would you like to uh, leave a message to our viewers? The message is to, to love those things, those sculptures, and see it again with a new eye. My dream is to finish the study I'm doing, and maybe when there are going to be about 15 pieces, very big paintings, uh, my dream is to go around the world in the museums or the schools or School of Fine Arts or all that to show and to speak and to explain because in our time which everything is very organized by computers and all that uh, it's nice to go back sometimes and to see how those people without computer without things with nothing they came to that level and you make the comparison the, you know to you see a little bit how they did it. They reached perfection. Yes, yeah. <laughs> because we need that. We have to go back sometimes to our roots, where we come from. We cannot wait to hear and see the rest of your study. Thank you so very much. <laughs>